All right, y'all, we need to get up in here and talk about this video today because honey, I don't know what to say about the world. I, I, the only thing that I think that I can say about the world is that we are going to hell in a handbasket, that this world is collapsing in on itself, you know, with all the things that it's, that's going on, we've got the gender stuff, we got all this stuff. This is like what happened before like the fall of Rome, right? We're in like the last bastions of society and civilization and it's all gonna crumble, right? So <laughs> I'm convinced. And today's video is gonna just put that icing on the cake for you. There is an apparition, our lady of good success. And it's happened like years and years ago in the 17th century. And in this apparition, our blessed Mo mother warns of the collapse of the nuclear family, the collapse of marriage and the collapse of the family as like, a huge problem within our faith and within the world. And it's haunting when you when you look at this stuff and you look at it through the lens of our faith to see all of these crazy things coming to pass. It's like, it's, it, it feels kind of helpless in many ways, right? So we have the red pill, which has really taken front center in the rhetoric around dating and relationships and all that other stuff. And the thing with the red pill is that I don't necessarily disagree with everything that they talk about with the red pill. I don't. And some of the stuff that they that they point out are real problems in society, real problems in the breakdown of the nuclear family and marriages in men and women today. It's it's so true. But the thing that makes it hard with the red pill is that the talking points that they have and the the, the what they think will fix the problems that we're seeing in society are all things that are rooted in Christ. And they take God completely out of that equation. And this is why their talking points never work. They, they don't have any real solutions. It's funny because our society and the, and the things that these guys in the red pill space are talking about that they'd like to see as far as families and stuff like that are all rooted in traditional values. And if we're gonna be really honest with ourselves for a moment here, it's Christianity, which has shaped the values of Western civilization for centuries. Christianity was at the head of everything. And whether people were devoutly practicing or not, and in most in those days, they people were pretty devout, whether they were, you know, how big of sinners they were and, and using the word of God against, you know, this, that, the other for their own agenda within nations and, and monarchies and war, that's a whole other deba debatable topic. But for the most part, these are people who were rooted in God and in faith, and they let laws and society be, be influenced by that faith as well. And these traditional values are all rooted in Christian values. Ephesians chapter five, Proverbs 31, the book of Titus, like so many things that talk about order and family, talk about the roles of men and women in society and community in the family. These are all rooted in scripture. The moment you take it all out, it falls apart. And that's where we are with this red pill space. Now, if you are not aware, we are going to watch Lila Rose, who I am a huge fan of. All right, I don't know how anyone could be in the Catholic space and not be like a huge Lila Rose stan, honey, because she is magnificent, her demeanor is a case study of first peter chapter 2 verse 12 in action this is what first peter says first peter says be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors then even if they accuse you of doing wrong they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to god when he judges the world and the way that she just approaches this whole entire conversation so calmly which she has so much grace under fire, so much just standing on what she believes in her Catholic faith and how she gives viable answers and solutions to everything that's brought up in this conversation. It's just, it's chef's kiss. Guys, watch this video, if not for that reason, and knowing how to approach things when people push back with you on certain rhetoric. And I wanna go over this video because, man, she takes down this guy, Jason Waller. Like, he is, just so bothered by her, so intimidated in many ways. He couldn't even face her and look at her. His entire body uh, language is facing away from her, literally trying to turn away from her is how repulsed he was by her presence. So I want to break this down and just kind of like give a critique about the red pill and bolster a bit of what Lila Rose was saying and just break it down in a little bit more conversational way. One of the things I get really frustrated with in the Catholic space is the conversation around dating. 
because the conversation around dating and relationships here in the Catholic space really focuses on one specific group. And that is anyone who's like in high school or fresh out of high school, you're just turning 18, fresh in life. You're going to university. You're at the prime beginnings of everything adulthood. And that kind of stuff that they talk about with Catholic dating works wonderfully in that realm to an extent. And I also think it pushes a little bit further past that for folks in their 20s. But once you get past 30, and particularly if you're over the age of 35, men or woman, these things that they talk about in Catholic dating go out the window. And I'm sad to say, even for you young people out there, it's no different because there's a lot of talk now that the recent report came out, 66% of young men between the ages of 18 and 30 are single. They are single and they're not necessarily men who don't want to date. Some of them may be men who've taken themselves out of the dating market, but some of them actually want to be in relationships, but they are not seen as viable partners in our society today. That is detrimental. Marriage rates are on the decline in the middle class. Okay. Things are not going good when it comes to dating relationships for anyone, like seriously. But I think that the, the rhetoric around Catholic dating is so delusional at best. We're going to do another video. We're going to call it Catholic dating tips. Why Catholic dating advice is delusional at best. It does not work in this climate with these crazy people. And we're going to see why when we watch this video. So hold on to, to your britches. All right, we got a lot of stuff. We're going to pull apart this whole video, talk about it. Listen, today's video is sponsored by me and my company, Rockstar Fitness. Guys, if you want to get into the best shape of your life, you want to just like change your body, you want to be healthy, you want to eat better. You want to have a body that's going to allow you to see it as a temple for the Holy Spirit, which lives within you. First Corinthians chapter six, verses 19 to 20. Okay. This body is not your own. You got to take care of it. All right. You got to take care of it. And being able to be present in this world with your health, with your fitness and everything aligned is important for you to go ahead and live the call that God has for you. So if you're interested in getting in the best shape of your life and you want fitness and faith to be at the forefront of that working together, come and talk to me, go ahead and scan the QR code that you see right here on your screen and check the link down below to set up a complimentary call. So we can talk about getting you into shape, honey. Also, if you want to go ahead and stay in contact with me, as far as the Catholic stuff is concerned, get on my email list. Link is down below, QR code on the screen. And finally, look, we got a ministry here. We got a ministry here and I want to share it with the world. I need your support. I want to go ahead and invite you to join the channel as a member right now, get exclusive videos, a lot of unscripted stuff off the cuff, talking about things of faith, life, and everything that's going on with me behind closed doors directly to you. So let's build that relationship a little bit more. We got rosaries back there. We got some prayers, we got all kinds of stuff. All right, extra stuff that ain't on the channel publicly, honey. Okay, listen, I can't, I can't let you see all of Roxy out here. Okay, you gotta come remember, come see Roxy. Let's talk some deep stuff, okay? So join us, remember, you see the QR code or you can click the link to go ahead and join and support today. Let's go ahead and get into this. So uh, this video again is Lila Rose, uh, on the whatever podcast. If you have not seen it, she was on the whatever podcast and it's a podcast that talks about dating relationships and all that stuff. And, uh, so let's go ahead and, and get into it. I want to pull apart what we're hearing, knock down this Jason Waller guy and just listen to, to this woman, just slay it. Let's go ahead and get into it. Lila Rose, I'm 34 and my occupation is the president of live action and I'm a writer and a speaker and a mom. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. What is uh, what is live action, by the way? We're a human rights organization defending children in the womb, mothers, fathers, and families. So based. What's been healing? My slut phase. What, what Having, you healed? So for me, I've been raised in the indoctrination that my job as a woman is to please my male partner, my husband. And as a woman, I was not given pleasure because that wasn't, it didn't have to be reciprocal. Getting divorced and discovering my sexuality, I learned my pleasure is just as important of a right. And so now I get to have that with different people, find out what I like, what I don't like, have different experiences to find out what turns me on, what turns me off. Mm -hmm. And that's healing to know yourself and to learn yourself and to feel good with your pleasure and not limit it because of what someone else thinks you should do with it. Nick, was that presented as Christianity to you that the man just gets the pleasure and the woman doesn't get any pleasure? Was I mean, I think it was more experience. It was more caught than taught. I think they would mm -hmm. they would say it's equal, but in practice, it was my job as a woman to support the man and whatever he wants. And so you just learn this messaging of 
well, what I want isn't as important. Though if you if I confront to them, they say, no, 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 you're just as important, but not in practice. But you didn't experience that in your marriage, it sounds like. Not the way I think it should have been. Correct. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, Because I think of an authentically Christian marriage, the man gives his life for the woman and absolutely equal sexual pleasure is very mm-hmm. important. That So I'm sorry that you didn't experience So I want to stop there for a second, because I think that's so important in this conversation, just kicking it off right away, getting right into the nitty gritty, honey, we're going to go ahead and talk about SEX, right? Our society today has become so incredibly carnal. Getting to know someone isn't about building the relationship anymore. Getting to know someone is about getting to know what that person's body is like, what they feel like, how they kiss and intimacy and touch and all of these things. And crazy enough, it's like we live in a society where the expectation when you're dating today is the three day room. The date rule, right? So you get to know someone, you go out, and by the third date, you're supposed to be smashing already. And it's just, this is not the basis to, w- to under which a fruitful relationship can build. So I think for young people, especially out here, you're you're getting this messaging that this is what's, what builds relationships and intimacy. And if you're in the Christian circles, and I think that this is something that you see a lot more with Protestant religions and Protestant denominations that the woman's pleasure is not important or that sex should not be pleasurable. And the truth of the matter is within Catholicism, one of the things that I absolutely love is Pope John Paul II's Theology of the Body. Guys, when I started to really get into reading Theology of the Body, studying what that's all about, Christopher West is in an incredible resource for this. It put the idea of sex on a completely different level. Like you learn about what the true meaning is for it. You learn to respect chastity as well and and how that not only plays in a single life, but how being chaste plays in the marital life as well. And how if you, when you really understand sex in its proper context, how it should be enjoyable, it should be pleasurable and it should happen between um, husband and wife. And so I think this is so unfortunate. There are so many of you out there who come from Christian backgrounds and maybe you are converting to Catholicism, or maybe you grew up in a Catholic home where sex was just not talked about and everything that has to do with the body and sexuality is dirty and bad. And women are there to serve their husbands and that's it. And it's not like that at all. So I really encourage you all no matter where you are in your vocation for life, whether you are single and waiting for marriage, or whether you're somebody who's already married, you're engaged or whatever, to start to study theology of the body and to really embrace what it is that the Catholic faith says about sex and how we are supposed to orient all of that to God. It's such a life-changing thing. And again, it just puts everything in a beautiful perspective for what our goals are when it comes to dating relationships and more. Now, I will say this, you're going to see this as we go through this entire broadcast, but this relationship stuff is hard. I mean, you might be putting this stuff in order in your life, male or female, but the rest of society is not approaching things like this. And so we'll probably talk about that in another video, just how do you deal with just being on this path to righteousness and trying to put everything together in a way that's coherent and makes sense in your walk with God? How do you put this together in a way that allows you to find partnership? And uh, I don't have that answer for you right now. We (laughs) want to talk about it in another video. But just some seeds what we want to plant. Let's go ahead and get back into the video. I might like family more than you. So much I have five. Do you think that's a good thing to have multiple families? I think it's good if there's one dad and there's not a bunch of step parents involved and, and the dad can be the hero and those five families live a 10x better life than they would have otherwise. Yes, ma'am, I do. Facts. But you don't think that it will be ultimately a, 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 an opportunity for jealousy or disharmony amongst women? Two are always going to be jealous. What, what, what's changed about that? Women have been marriage. jealous all the way through time. So, I'm not jealous in my marriage. I don't care about your marriage. I'm talking about mine. This guy is so triggered. This is what I'm talking about. Like so triggered by just her presence. It's just so funny to see like, you know, in the red pill space, they're always talking about how men should have comportment and men should be a non-emotional and thinking on logic and nothing that he's saying right now is built on any kind of logic. Right. And, and, and there is this conversation within the red pill space about the quote unquote high value man. And I suppose he would categorize himself as a high value man talking about how women in these relationship with these so-called high value men should be 
expecting these men to step outside of their relationships, expecting these men to cheat. In his case, expecting him to have multiple children with multiple women and to be totally fine with that. You guys, this is disordered thinking. And even in the context, if you want to put this into traditional values, because at the same time that they're, they're saying this, they're expecting women to be submissive to them. They're expecting women to take care of the home, to take care of the children. But it's that stuff and what they're trying to get at, again, is things that, that harken back to the past. And in the American culture of the past, it always has been a monogamous society. Now, what, whether people were actually being monogamous is a whole other thing, but Lila Rose is going to hit on something that I think is really important that talks about that rhetoric about how men who actually were stepping up, stepping out of their relationships, men who were having extramarital affairs and all these other things. It was actually tests that were done in a specific population with people like Kinsey and all of his diabolical studies and stuff that, that he was talking about around sex. They were actually not looking at the greater population, but they've convinced the population that this is what is normal. And this is what people are doing. This is what men are doing. Every man on the planet is, cannot control his sexual urges and he needs to bust, you know, bust up the club in thousands of women and have thousands of kids running around, right? That does not work. If you're willing to have children outside of wedlock, especially if you have multiple children outside of wedlock, because there are some men out there who are quote unquote high value who have this kind of a situation, it makes me question how much you actually value yourself because your legacy is something you would want to protect. Your legacy is something that you would, would, you would not want to have with hundreds of women, five, 10, 15, whatever numbers of women that you think is viable in the red pill space. These conversations make no kind of sense. And for women today, I think that this red pill conversation is really trying to get you to have lower standards, number one, and to just accept anything. When you start to see this rhetoric as normal, you open yourself up to abuse and more. And here's the thing, people wanna throw abuse into this conversation, like a woman being submissive to a man is going to open her up to abuse. Nothing is further from the truth. The fact of the matter is that proper submission under the will of God has you in submission to each other and you both in submission to God. It's not a man's place to rule over a woman and to smash her down and to make her subservient to him. It is to lead, it's headship. It's taking responsibility of provision and protection for you as a woman. But this rhetoric that they put out there when they talk about submissiveness in this red pill culture, it's the perverted version of that. Of that, It's the sinful version of that. A man who has multiple children, multiple families with multiple women is a man who cannot control his sexual desire and his lust. And that is a twisted perversion of what God has in mind for sex for man and woman. Let's go ahead and get in, back into it. Well, my life is gonna be, so I don't answer to you, so. That's my answer. I'm gonna run my, my situation exactly how I want to. And generally, when I do that, that's when I have the most happiness, let's say, in my life. So, that's all. And you would want that for your daughters? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I live my life unapologetically on my terms. So if my daughters that are overly spoiled and, and educated in every way and have friends all over the world and world traveled in the best schools in the world, if they have a problem with me at the end of the day, then they can kick rocks too. I, I, I'm not going to simp for my daughters. I'll love them fully. Mm -hmm. But if they grow up and turn into a person that doesn't want to get in line with me or at least, look, here's my goal as a parent. Teach my children how the world works. Give them the skills so they can live on their own terms and give them choice. If they choose not to make me part of their life after I've given them those things, I've still succeeded as a father. But I guess I'm asking if you're comfortable answering, obviously, but are you wanting to be a role model for your kids? Is that part a of A thousand your percent. Goal? A father should show up in every way for his children. Mm -hmm. I think I'll be better than most fathers, regardless of how many children mm -hmm. I have. I might have a hundred. Mm -hmm. But so. you think part of being a role model, it's okay for your kids not to know even their, your relationship status with their own mom? They will know the relationship there, status with me and their mother. But you have other relationships with other women, too. What, what does that have to do with anything? But I'm just wondering if you think... I haven't even said that. I'm just saying, like, if I mm -hmm. want to, I will. But you don't think that's a problem for your daughter to know that about their dad, that, that he has multiple mistresses? That's up to my daughter, man. You know? But do you want your daughter to have a guy like that long term? If he takes care of her in every way and she has a much better life because of it, yeah. I think that this is completely disingenuous. 
I really do. And you can tell that he was being tripped up by her questions because the more she asked, the more he could not answer, the more he just kept stumbling over his words. Because when you start to listen to the rhetoric, it doesn't make any sense. It starts collapsing. This is such a prime example of dysfunction in the family unit, right? This is the stuff that Our Lady of Good Success said, hey, you got to watch out for that that Satan is going to attack the family unit, unit. And that is how Satan is going to ruin society. And we see this unfolding here with this red pill talking point. The problem of this is, is that as children, when you're rearing children, your relationship with that their mother is the example of what they have to try to repu replicate to do for themselves. And for a girl, let's talk about in, in the female sense, for a girl to grow up and see that her father had so little respect for her mother and the divinity of her mother and her mother's womb and the safety of her mother's health, that he had so little regard for that, that he had to satisfy his sexual carnal urges instead and take on multiple women. What she learns from that is that she will never be enough of a woman for one man. And that goes against everything that we believe as Catholics. And this is why I think that in society, people are going to do what they want to do when it comes to all this red pill rhetoric. And the, the thing about it is that most people who are into this, they don't truly believe in God in the way that we are expected to as Christians. They may use God as a little placard in their life, quote unquote. It's like, oh yeah, I praise God, I pray. And I, but I don't. They, they don't live by what the Christian life is. And if they were, they would see the inherent problem with this. Children understand about relationships and what they see growing up. And in order for them to be able to know how to foster a committed relationship and a strong family unit, they got to see that in action in their families. No way you can do that. Having all the women that, that he says that he would have, and then having, like you said, oh, I could have a hundred kids. What kind of logic does that really make though? Right. At the end of the day, it's just completely insane to be honest with you. And if we were to flip it around to say for young boys, for a young boy to grow up and to see that his father was a man who was like a sexual deviant, that the only thing that he saw women as was something for his pleasure and not something to actually invest his time and energy in. There's no way one man can divide his time between multiple women and their multiple children and think that he's giving all of himself as a father. At best, you're going to just be someone that is like, passing ships in the night. You might be able to go ahead and have a relationship with your kids, but if you're not present in the home with them, they don't see love modeled. They don't see family modeled. They don't see the dynamics between men and women in a healthy way or, or a spouse, a husband, wife in a healthy way. They don't see this modeled. How will they know what to do? All they know to do is turn to the debauchery, the twisted version of that, which is what he's promoting. And that's a very dangerous thing. Ask you one more question. Fire away, honey. Okay. <laughs> um, if you have a place and only one place in your heart for one woman, or you want to have one woman in your heart, I think you said, why don't you just commit to one and choose to be faithful to her? I'm just not wired that way. I spent my whole 20s trying to fix myself. I thought you're something a was man wrong of self-control. You, you work out, you do business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can possess your own your own power it's and do not, direct just, it the way you want to direct it. It's not how I am. It's not how I am. I've you think tried. that might be a limited mindset? I think it's none of your business, but I don't want you to think I'm triggered by you. I'm not. <laughs> I saw somebody say that, and I think that's interesting. I think you're annoying, but I'm not triggered. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? No, you are. You're annoying in, in like this goody two shoes type way, and that's fine. <laughs> He's so uh, triggered. I'm going to live my life on my terms, unapolog uh, unapologetically, mm -hmm. like truly. So triggered. So. Uh, you can ask me this 85 different ways. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I'm going to walk out of here the same man. He is so triggered by her. You see the emotional response. Like instead of asking, answering the question, he went and made it personal. And that's because she dug into him with a question that makes complete sense. It's like, don't you think that you thinking that you cannot have the sexual control to be with one woman, that's a limited belief. This is a guy who's supposed to be top of the world, money, money maker, go get a shot caller, baller. That's back in the 90s type of thing, right? This is the guy that's supposed to be this alpha leader, but you have no sexual discipline whatsoever. That's the only place that you're not quote unquote wired 
to be in control of your life. When you are, when your desires and your lusts are in control of you, you have no control. You are susceptible to being manipulated in so many ways, so many ways. And that's the problem again with this rhetoric. These men are trying to push this traditional values thing when it comes to women, but not for themselves as men. So it's traditional for thee, but not for me. And it never works like that. It never works at all. And if you notice too on the panel, the kind of women that are on there, are always women on these podcasts that they feature that are obviously very promiscuous women who live their life very sexually free. Some of them are only fans models or into all kinds of adult film work and all the other stuff or sex work. And they always want to espouse how these women are so modern, these modern women, expecting them to have traditional values when women who have traditional values do not present themselves this way. So I find it so funny in this conversation as well that these guys try to browbeat these women who are obviously modern women who have no interest in any of the stuff that they're talking about submission and all this other stuff raising the kids and da, da, da. they they don't want that but these men are trying to fit these square pegs into these round holes and it's just hilarious to me it doesn't make any sense right anyhow let's go ahead and get back into it there was actually a study done where 70 percent of men have cheated on their wives at one point or another yeah. this was in part by design because the sexual revolution happened right in the 60s and the 70s and there was this sexologist named alfred kinsey let's go. i don't know if anyone has heard of him but he was he's kind of known as the godfather or the grandfather of sexology today mm -hmm. and so his ideology has really influenced a lot of sex ed today and a lot of behavior today and so what he did he wanted to prove that everybody was sexually deviant was the term at the time, sexually deviant. They weren't in monogamous relationships, or if they were, they'd lie, and they were in swinger culture and other kinds of relationships. And he wanted to mainstream this idea because he wanted to break down the natural family, single mother, single father, together, married together, and with, with children. Yeah. And so what he ended up doing is he created social data, research data, and he would actually survey prison populations for their sexual experiences, and he would use that and claim that this was representative of the entire population. So actually, he would say, he would ask you know interview convicts or have people interview convicts and who were involved in all kinds of dark stuff, and they would share yeah we've been in, obviously in bestiality, rape, or we've been involved in having many different partners. And then he said this is representative of so 70 percent or 80 percent of Americans he claimed are involved in swinger culture or polyamory behind closed doors. But he was lying is the thing. But so you're telling me that, that stat she just referenced is total I BS. I don't know exactly where you got that stat, but I think it might be a Keynesian stat because a lot of his statistics kind of created the groundswell for that mentality. And then the problem is it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So if everybody thinks, oh, it's normal to have sex with a, mil a ton of different people, it's normal to not be monogamous, it's actually good to not be monogamous, right? That's the message of society tells you, you know, porn is good, sleeping around is good, sex is not a big deal, then it kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because more and more people get sexualized and get, you know, start down that path. And unfortunately in our society too, a lot of young girls, I mean, I heard what you shared, Kirsten, right? Mm -hmm. It's horrible. Like with that guy, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, right? But he was probably watching porn, right? So he's being trained by his pornography mm -hmm. to treat you like an object. I mean, he didn't even talk to you about it. He just did this gross yeah. thing to you and you're like, what the heck? You walk out, right? But he was trained by porn to do that. That's not normal. Like a little boy doesn't grow up and become that naturally as a man. He's trained yeah. to think and become deviant. She just dropped so many gems right there. And we got to just stop and just talk about that much. This is why I think that when we talk about the dating world, when it comes to Catholicism, like this is where I say that everything is so delusional because you got people who are in marriages like 10, 15, 20 years now talking about how you need to date as a Catholic. And they have not been in this culture. They've not been single in this culture for literally like a decade or more. And the, the world of dating that they remember is not the same. It's just not. And the whole thing about that is that it just adds a whole layer of just struggle and things that you have to wade through as Catholics in dealing with other people or trying to find other like-minded like, like Catholics to have a real relationship with. So many people are dealing with 
pornography today. So many people are dealing with sexual deviancy. There's so much out there that you have to fight with spiritual warfare, just to be able to find someone compatible. And I guess, you know, for this conversation, I want to speak to those of you who are a little bit younger, because I feel like you guys are so much under attack, under the age of like, 25 or so everything to you and, and it, it's, it's just it's heightened than anything any of us who are over 30 over 35 have ever experienced you know we were just probably getting more of this in our late teens early 20s you know or so like that these influences are coming after our youth today they're coming after the children so it's so hard out there i do respect justin waller because in this section, because he actually seems to agree with her when it comes to the promiscuity and the pornography and stuff like that. It seems like they're actually on the same page. And I'm seeing a little bit more on the red pill side talk about this for men. It's the pornography is just so detrimental to just the way that we go about understanding sex, understanding relationships. When you are so addicted to that, or you have your vices rooted in that, it is so hard to break. And my heart goes out to those of you who are afflicted with this. Y'all got to stay up in prayer. Y'all got to like really do the stuff that you have to do to overcome it. But this is one of those things that's like become normal in our society. These statistics that talk about men not being able to be faithful, men not being able to be monogamous, these are not actually statistics that are necessarily rooted in much fact. And when you actually go back and see where this came from, the Kinsey work has been so diabolical in our society today. Kinsey did a number and then the people that came after him, I would even throw Freud into the mix with his stuff. Like there were all of these scholars and then you have other, then you have people wrapped up in the arts world that like just kind of put this out there in a way that they try to normalize it. So greater society could embrace it to the point to where we are today. We see this happening over and over too with the transgenderism and that whole talk, topic, gender identity, gender normalcy and, and, and the like. We're seeing it happen in real time. And this stuff is dangerous because this is what we think. Men can't control themselves because there's no way a man can control himself when it comes to his sexuality. Nothing is further from the truth. Men who actually are able to control themselves will tell you differently. Um, and, it, and it's not different for women today either, because women are taught to be promiscuous. Women are taught at very young ages that being sexually free is fine. Women, young girls rather, are being exposed to pornography as much as young boys are. So you don't learn about anything about respect for yourself, respect for your body. And it's, it's, a, it's a situation that's scary and it's giving, getting out of hand at this point. Let's go ahead and jump back in. Do what you want. Like that's the thing, like no one's being harmed here. No one's being coerced. No one's being manipulated. It's like, I desire this. Do you desire this? Yes, great. We're all on the same page. Here, here's a question. Do you think all desires should be acted on? All sexual no. desires? No. And that's, which, a, that's, a, that's a common accusation. That's like, oh, well then you're gonna, like, bestiality is always thrown in there, which is so ridiculous. I think you said something no. really interesting, <laughs> Nick, you were talking about like sexual desires and mm. the desire to act out on our different sexual desires. And I think there's this mentality in our culture today that if someone has a sexual desire, then that is their identity. That can become their identity if they have enough of a sexual desire in one direction. That's their identity. And so, but I don't think that's true. I don't think we're defined by our desires. For I think sure. we're defined by what we choose. I love pegging and I do not identify as a pegger. <laughs> it's like, I love threesomes and I don't identify as a threesome. It's like, I'm Nicole Mitchell a woman who's alive and in tune with what she wants and lets herself have it with consenting adults and there's nothing wrong with that. I disagree. I all kinds of experiences, but it doesn't mean I have to identify as each of those things. I love Oreos. I'm not an Oreo. This is something I'm super passionate about because I think there's been a version of maybe fundamentalist Christianity that people have experienced that they, they felt really hurt by. And so they've kind of lashed out against it and rejected it. And I see this a lot, actually. Um, but the reality is when... You know, I actually, so I was raised Protestant, went through this kind of semi-agnostic phase, kind of like you went through, and then I ended up Catholic after doing a ton of study and a ton of research and just being convinced by the beauty of it. And it was learning about how men and women are equal dignity, they're mm -hmm. equal partners, learning about sex, what God's design is, which is a beautiful one, that it is about pleasure. It mm -hmm. absolutely is about pleasure, and pleasure it's not dirty or shameful, but it's also about procreation and the ability to bring life into the world, and it's designed to be within marriage where you're in a lifelong public 
commitment to someone that you're going to give yourself 110% to. And that's how you build a beautiful family of love and respect and your children are secure in your love that you have with your spouse. And so, you know, I don't know all of your experiences, obviously, and everyone has had different experiences, but the reality is the social data proves that monogamous lifelong marriages make people happiest, they have the most sex and the best sex, and kids are healthier that way. And so that's why I know you're excited about that vision, uh, Chase, and that's why we want to share that vision, not just because of some fundamentalist thing, but because it actually makes people happier and healthier in the long run. She's absolutely right about that. And the interesting thing is that there is research and data to back this up. And that's one of the things I think we need to really ask ourselves as Catholics, because we have such a beautiful just unfolding of God's expectations of us in relationships and marriage and sex and all that stuff through our faith. Pope John Paul II, I'm going to say it again, theology of the body just kind of unlocks this beautiful understanding of sex. If you are someone who's into fornication and you're falling into that sin and you you know if you are sleeping with your with your significant other that's something that you both need to sit down and figure out and, and start to turn yourself away from but we, we, we we're under this impression that we're not able to do that that we're not able to just be chased or be order things in the way that they should be which is to god and it's hard when you've already been out there and doing this stuff. But the thing is, is that research after research after research shows that this is actually the healthier way to do things. In fact, the more sexual partners you've had, the harder it is to actually find satisfaction in your relationships. And I know that there's that rhetoric out there that men are not the same, that men can have as many sexual partners as possible, and they are able to still emotionally connect to women. And I actually, I question that actually. Yes, our bodies are different. For women, sex can be very bonding. It's supposed to be. It's our protection mechanism in case we get pregnant and all these other things. Oxytocin goes up. So sex actually bonds us to our male partner. And for men, sex is not the same thing. Like they need to have more testosterone and they need to actually spend time getting to know a woman to build that kind of intimacy. That's why having sex right away is a terrible idea. It's absolutely terrible. But I also think that for men, from a standpoint of a woman who does not have a whole bunch of sex partners, who is not a promiscuous woman, who even if a woman may not be a virgin, you know, you have women who are virgins, let's consider that. Being with a man who has had a lot of sex partners is just gross. Like, again, it does it shows that you do not have respect for your own body, your own sexuality, and that you're after your own pleasure. It's the same kind of thing, the way that men look at women who've had a lot of sexual partners as just like, ill, like, you know, red flag, red flag. And if she hasn't repented about it, she hasn't decided to live a chaste life about it. I think men fall into that same kind of bracket. It's like you get that more and more and more sensation. And, and then if you're having that many sex partners as a man, there's a case of, are you going to get bored with your current person that you decide to settle down with? So there's a lot of healing on both sides, men and women, that need to happen when you have been promiscuous in your life. And chastity is where that can be found. Prayer and the sacraments and just that whole thing is where you're going to be able to heal that. But you've got to heal that if you're going to have a, a, a healthy relationship. Unfortunately, our culture does not support that kind of a thing. You have to do that on your own. Let's go ahead and finish up this video. What do you mean? Do you think that when you commit your life to someone and you're going to build a family with them, do you uh -huh. think that should be done in community, so public? I, I think that's up to the people that do it. I don't think there's a right way to do it at all. Mm -hmm. so, so that's so up to you. So you think like for children, they shouldn't, they don't have the right to know whether or not their parents are married and be able to feel that when they go into society. Yeah, I, I think that if your if your kids ask, you should tell them the truth, 100. percent There's no lie or no, nothing I would ever keep from a child of mine. Meaning the truth about no, we're not married. I have other other people I'm sleeping with. Whatever they ask me, I would answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think as somebody that was raised by a single mom, like those things, they, they, they don't matter as much to your child as you think that they may. I mean, it did have an effect on my relationships going, growing up, but it's also something like you can learn from that experience through your parents, you know, like you can, as long as you have open communication with your child, 
and I don't have any children, but I have younger siblings, and I'm openly communicative with all my family members. Well, I think what's most important when it comes That's, to kids is their love in the house. Do they exactly. see love between their parents? Mm -hmm. Not not or, or, are they live in the way of, of making people that go to church happy? Mm -hmm. It's a very downward deflecting question you're asking me, and I understand why you're doing it. However, I'll put love first in front of marriage every day of the week because people get married in America every weekend, putting the marriage and the Facebook pictures before the actual love. Mm -hmm. So I'll take the love over all the bullshit. I think that's probably true. There's a lot it's of... It's definitely true. There's a lot of hypocrisy out there, for sure. There's a lot of hypocrisy in Christianity as well. Yeah. Like Bible thumping people that want to beat you up with their views and ask silly questions about things that don't matter. Like, is your kid going to be upset that you have other women? All I'm worried about is being a good fucking father and a provider and giving them a life full of love. And if I can do that, I've been quite, quite successful. In fact, I'd say more successful than most Christians. I just had to stop for a minute before she goes into that. It's just... It's it's the little digs, right? That you can tell she, she's just under his skin. He just cannot handle himself. And it's just hilarious to me in that way. But, you know, he has a point. We cannot deflect when he makes a point and it's the right point. Because so many people today, and this is, this is kind of where Christianity kind of goes awry. It's like, so many people today do place a lot of value on the marriage and the optics of marriage. So many, you have so many content creators out here pretty much demeaning women who are not married by a certain age, who are not mothers, who do not have the husband and the perfect Catholic family. You have so many creators out there who make you feel less than. I think that's a very dangerous thing because at the end of the day in today's society, it's harder and harder to achieve that. And for some people who came into the faith a little bit later, maybe they were ca they were cradle Catholics, but they did not follow in the ways that would be expected to marry young and have children. Or maybe they made other choices. And, and at the end of the day, as men and women, you have to sit with the choices that you've made. But when you're trying to repent and to do things better, you can't come down on those people. You have to give them support. You gotta give them support and they, you know, give them the, the opportunities or help them to, to be able to have the opportunities to create these families and marriages. But I think that he is right in that our society today, we place too much emphasis on the optics and the optics are not together. The optics have no foundation. It's just about that wedding day, the photos, the social media, and that's it. And we have to be beyond that. We really do. So when he, when he gets something in the pocket, we gotta give it to him. And I totally agree. Let's go back into this and see what Lila Rose has to say totally wanting the best for the other person and that it's committed and that it's sacrificial and that it's exclusive, it's faithful. And fidelity, I think, is a really important part of love. And if you don't have fidelity in love, then you don't have the security and the opportunity for full vulnerability. Can I throw a hypothetical at you? Yeah, please do. If, and this is a hypothetical, please, so please don't get offended, but if your husband were to do something that was not okay with you whatsoever, to the point where you did not any longer want to be with him, whether that's cheating or something else, that's just a no for you. Would you leave she them? Would, stay. would you leave them to just please your 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 children and to keep your family together? Is that like some you're willing to risk your own happiness and well being or even safety if it was something that was that extreme? Are you talking about abuse? I'm I'm d d using a hypothetical. Okay. Whatever it is that would be like a straight, like I need to leave this sure. person. Would you stay with them just for the convenience and also the toxicity that it could bring into your household? I want to I want to just interject for one minute. I want you guys to listen carefully to how she answers this because for those of you who are considering Catholic marriage and you know for our faith, you know that marriage is 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 for life. It's binding. And divorce isn't something that we do. And getting annulments isn't as easy as just saying, hey, I want to just get this annulled as though the, the, the marriage did not exist. This is why discernment is so important in this entire conversations around relationships and why the red pill information could be so detrimental if you're not properly discerning with God in the present, God in the mix. So let's go ahead and see what Lila Rose has to say because she answers this absolutely brilliantly. Infect, and inflicting your, your children, you know? So my position is if, and it's the position of the Catholic Church as well, which is that if you're in a situation in a marriage that's abusive, right? It's causing harm to you or your children, then you definitely should create separation. You should leave. You can actually get a legal divorce if you need to separate your assets. But the position of the church and, and my belief is that marriage is forever um, until death to us part. 
mm-hmm. until death was part. So mm-hmm. you can marry someone and they become a screwball. You know, they totally mess up. They they do bad things, and you should separate yourself from them um, for your protection or your kids' protection. Uh, but you then don't go on and just remarry and try to live another life. Um, now there's something. In the case, if you were lied to, so there's something called annulment, which some people say, oh, that's Catholic divorce. It's actually not. Annulment is when the mar- it's as if the marriage never happened because it's, people were lying, typically, when they go into the marriage. So like typically, abusers don't just start abusing after marriage. They're abusing before marriage, or they're lying. Mm-hmm. So if they're lying to you in a serious way and you go into a marriage, you weren't free, able to freely choose that marriage. And so afterwards, you can request an annulment from the church and be like, hey, I don't think I was even married because I didn't freely choose this. I didn't know this guy was a liar and you know, addicted to pornography and abuse and all these things. And so in that case, you could nullify the marriage and then re- be, free to ma- re- be free to get, actually get married. I want to say something just to be completely fair to you. I think what you have in your marriage is absolutely beautiful. No Thank problem you. with it at all. I think that if you two are happy and like living together in the Lord and like you see a future that even that goes past this life to heaven. I think that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. No Thank issue you. at all. Well, and and you should yeah. be commended for doing it, mm-hmm. you know, properly. Well, but I, and not I, properly in regards to your religion. I don't mean to cut you off, mm-hmm. but properly in, in regards to like what you are setting out to do with him. Mm-hmm. I think that's a beautiful thing. Well, we're, we're definitely imperfect people figuring it out. Right. And that's what yeah. part of marriage is, is becoming better together, you know, in that total commitment to each other. Um, but the thing is like, I'm passionate about not just wanting it for myself. Right. Like, I'm very grateful to be married. It has rooted my life. It has anchored my life. It has changed my life. But I don't want to just keep that to myself and be like, oh, this is just my personal thing over here. I want other people to re- to have the opportunity yeah. for that. Too. What do you think it takes for women to get in a position to find a husband that will commit to them fully and give their life to them? What do you think that takes? Well, I think the first step is uh, working on yourself and your own development as a woman, becoming the best that you can be. And then having good standards for the man that you're going to be with. Like, to be perfectly honest with you, I would not ever date a guy who I thought would be unfaithful to me. Not even date him. Never. If I found out my person I was dating is sleeping with other women or sleeping with anyone, honestly, because I don't, I didn't have, we didn't have sex before marriage, I'd be like, no, I'm not, yeah. I'm not uh, interested in but that. But I ask you what, what you think a woman needs to do. I think the woman needs to become the best she can be. She needs to grow psychologically, be healthy. If she needs to heal from trauma from her childhood, a lot of us have baggage. I had baggage. Go get the therapy that you need. Um, really understand. Do you not what, do you not believe that that therapy is in the church and Christianity? Do I not believe what? Do you not believe it's everything that you need is at church? You can't just find that in the Word. Well, the beauty of so the beauty of Catholicism is it's very much focused on the whole person, right? Uh-huh. So it's not like we're just spiritual beings, right? We're also bodies with desires, with traumas, with with experiences, and so the psychological world and you know psychological health is an important part of bodily health, um, and it connects to your spiritual health. So therapy is great, you know. Obviously, we totally promote therapy for those that need it. Mental health is really important. So just because you're doing the right thing spiritually doesn't mean you're necessarily mentally healthy. You may need to get mental health support too. I think this is actually something a lot of people who are really spiritual fall into. They think, oh, if I'm just pray enough, I can make my depression go away, right? And yes, sometimes God does just heal depression like that. But a lot of the time, God uses natural means like a good therapist, you know, a good psychiatrist to help somebody through that. I think that's fantastic. And I kind of want to, this is a very long video. Um, There's probably another 12 minutes or so left. And I want to kind of just end it right there on that note for now, because I think you guys get uh, kind of the gist of where this conversation is. And if you want to see the whole thing, I'll go ahead and post it below, because I think it's a wonderful, uh, just a wonderful discussion. And she talks about a lot more things, but I think that this is perfect. Here's the thing, guys. Life is hard and it's getting harder. Finding relationships is hard and it's getting harder. I don't have the answers. You know, I always say that here on my channel. I don't have the answers. I just can plant seeds as to what we can all do to try to heal ourselves and then try to move forward towards what our goals are. And not only that, towards what God's will for our lives are because the truth of the matter is, is that like as much as you may be yearning for marriage and family on your heart, for a lot of us, it's not going to happen. And I, society, unfortunately, has made it that way. We've fallen further and further away from God and just from just traditional values that statistics are showing us is that this plan, this diabolical plan to ruin marriage, family relationships, to put enmity between man and woman. Satan is really winning that battle in so many ways, but 
The question is, what can you do to try to prepare yourself? And I, and I want to leave it with that conversation today. He asked a fantastic question. But by the way, let's go ahead and, and give him his credit where credit is due. He did say, hey, you know, what you're doing is really great. And he asked, how can women do that? Right. And so I want to I want to give him his accolades. I also want to I want to note his body language because notice how his body language has actually changed where before he was really sitting away from her. And now he started to open up and his he was actually looking at her. You can tell there were points where he was starting to actually break down that like complete wall he had up. And so some of the stuff that she was saying was obviously hitting him. But here's my take. I can't tell a man what to do because I'm not a man. I'm a woman. So guys in the comments, why don't you go ahead, those of you who are working towards preparing yourself to be a husband, be a leader, family, if you are a husband already, you're a leader, you are, you know, in a Catholic marriage, why don't you go ahead and share your thoughts below for the men. But for the women, what I would say, the Bible says one thing really profound, and that is he who finds a wife finds a good thing and finds favor with the Lord. And when I knew I was starting to have that call in my life to really focus on um, preparing for marriage and what would that look like, I'd ask myself, what the hell does that mean? Like, he who finds a wife, like, how do I be a wife? What, what does that mean in the eyes of God? And I talked about finding identity in Christ, and, and I'm going to go ahead and post that video link right here. You'll see it on the screen somewhere and down below. But like, when I started to remove like the world's labels from my life, I was able to open myself as a channel for God to tell me who I am through Christ, through him. And it opened me up to really get into what femininity really means and what it looks like through the eyes of the Lord. Having a servant's heart, what that means, being a more receptive and empathetic woman, being a woman who is not afraid to go in and put in the work when it comes to family and responsibility with that. And to be able to also in today's society as a woman, to be able to be stand on my own two feet, but not be completely independent to think that I don't need anything or anyone, that you can't let someone else in. It's taught me how to have more discernment about life. And then on top of everything else, I had to learn how to heal my traumas. We all have them. You know, we none of us have had a perfect life where nothing has happened to you. You're just like on like beds of roses and you're so fantastic that you don't have any baggage that you need to release. We all have it in some way, shape or form. And always looking at how I can get rid of that baggage, unpack it, really get to the bottom of the things that hold me back from being the best woman that I can in Christ. Those are, those are the really important things. That's what you really have to hold that mirror up and look at, look at the things that you know are your flaws and your sins and your vices and your propensities that draw you away from Christ, how to make that solid and stronger. That's what you have to do to prepare yourself. So that way, when you meet that man who is that God has ordained for you, you can clearly see him. It's like breaking down your expectations of what men should have based off of what the world tells you that men should be. You can see the man clearly living in Christ such as you and discern whether or not that's going to work for what you guys want to do to together when it comes to your future, your values, how you see children, raising children, what kind of life you want to live, where you want to live, and all that stuff, economics between family dynamics, you know, that kind of thing. You can have an, an, a more clear view of what God has in store for you when you work on yourself first. The other thing I want to call to your attention is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, which for people who are in that single vocation right now, you're in that single life, you're in that waiting, where Paul talks about how it's better to be celibate and serving the Lord with all of your heart, all your mind, all your soul. This is Jesus told us to, if you can control your sexual urges. And if you cannot, then definitely your goal needs to be get married instead of being out here fornicating, doing all these things, right? But I want you to look deeper at that. It's that you have to be so content in your life and where you are, even as a single person, male or female, you have to be living and serving the Lord every single day, male or female. So when that person that comes along, that is your Adam or your Eve that came from your side and, and, and you are supposed to form two as one in life here and for eternity, you can identify that person. And also you're, you'll be ready to really take on that world together but at the same time, you're not doing it from a place of desperation. And that's hard when you've been in waiting for a long time. That's hard when you're out of your 20s, it's hard. It's hard when you're out of your 30s. It's hard when you're out of your 40s and you're sitting here single and you're looking around like, my, my, my stars, like where is he or where is she? 
and it can really take over your life in a negative way and cause you to go astray from the Lord. So how do you get to the point you, for women? He who finds a wife finds a good thing and finds favor with the Lord. So prepare yourself and, and learn what that means to you. It's there in scripture. It's there. We have examples of womanhood that are fantastic. Find it and, and really look into that. Men, you're not off the hook though. You know, when a woman is looking at you, we're going to go straight to Ephesians 5. It tells us that a man is supposed to love his wife like Christ loved the church. What did Christ do for the church? He died for the church. You have to be willing to put down your life and die. Die to yourself, die to your ego, die for your family. You know, and, and that's really hard to think about. Like, that's such a great responsibility. It's so great of a responsibility as a man. But when we're looking at you as men, we want to see Christ in you. We want to see a man who can lead, a man that you know as a woman that you can put your life into. Your He has that. He has you. He has the responsibility of your womb. He's going to make sure that he does not bring anything into that connection that would put your health and your sanity at risk. You want to be able to look at this man and know that he has your heart, that he's there to protect you, and that he's there to really stand up and be Christ-like and priestly in your life. He can lead and be strong. And that that comes from God. You know, guys, the, the alpha stuff is great. You being able to make money, get out there, do your thing, you know, create that legacy. That's great. That's one part. But what about this other part, the spiritual part? the emotional part. Some of you have been so scarred by women today. And I understand. I listen. I know I hear the stories, but like, how do you heal from that? So that way, when you meet that woman that is ordained from you, that comes from your rib, like Adam and Eve, that you can identify her and do right by her. So that's what I wanted to touch on today. But what I do want to do is hear your thoughts. Go down below and let's go ahead and talk about this. What are your thoughts on this? What are your thoughts on the red pill? Have you as a man or a woman, have you been embroiled in the red pill and gotten sucked up into that? How did you release yourself from that so you can start to find your path to marriage and relationships and companionship led by the example of Christ, led by our faith. Go ahead and post that below. I'd love to hear that. And we were talking a lot about the topic of submission and what that means. And I did a video. I actually did two videos. And, and one of them is a member video where we talked about the alpha male and what that means and how that is detrimental to society. I might open it up, but if it's not, when you watch this in the replay or whatnot, you can still watch it by going right over here and checking that out. Um, and then I also did a video about submission for women and what that actually looks like through Christ. So look at these two videos next and I will see you over there. Thank you so much for joining.